the global economy is on a journey. A transformational journey. To shape the horizon. Enabling the digital economy. An opportunity for global finance. Adapting our strategy. Harnessing technologies. Data. AI. Automation. Managing challenges. Compliance. Cybersecurity. Digitalization. Changing the way humankind engages. Agility. Insight. User experience. We must journey with the customer. Together. There's no better place to debate the depth of opportunity. Sharing ideas and insights. Great minds. Great talent. Enabling the digital economy. Together. Welcome to Sydney. Welcome to Cybos. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chairman of SWIFT, Yawa Shah. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to Cybos. Welcome to Sydney. 7,000 bankers and technologists are gathered here from over 150 countries. I would like to formally recognize our host country, Australia, for its hospitality and acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respect to the elders, both past and present. So the last time we gathered here was 2006 with a theme of raising ambitions. And look at the fabulous environment we're in. We are at the same site, but the venue and the surroundings are totally different. And the theme for this year's Cybos is enabling the digital economy. So Australia is transforming its financial markets infrastructures to meet the needs of the 24 by 7 digital economy. Australia is also one of the world's top fintech innovation areas. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome our guest speaker to the Cybos stage, Shane Elliott, Chief Executive Officer of ANZ, one of the largest listed companies here in Australia and a leading global bank operating in 34 countries worldwide. Shane has been an international banker for more than 25 years. And as a truly global citizen, he's worked on all five continents. He's been the CEO of ANZ since January 2016. And before that, he was ANZ's chief financial officer. Shane will share his thoughts with us in a conversation with Julius Foster from Cybos TV. Juliet and Shane, the floor is yours. Welcome to Cybos. Thank you. Thanks. Would you put over there? I'll go over there. Okay. <clears throat> Shane, what was interesting in that address was this reference to Australia in terms of transformation. Some really fascinating things are happening. Tell me, what is going on in this country? Well, there's a lot going on in Australia for those who follow it. Actually, at the moment, it's a really interesting time to be in the industry. We have this significant process happening called a Royal Commission, which is looking into a behaviour of the past and where actually our industry has failed. And that's probably dominating uh, the newspapers and the thinking around our industry. And we've got a lot of work to do. And at the same time, we are confronted with the challenges and the massive opportunity about the transformation that's happening in our industry, where Australia positions pretty well globally in terms of digitisation, new customer experiences. And the challenge for us, of course, is grappling with both, dealing with very legitimate issues of the past and making cultural changes necessary, and then really embracing the need to transform for the new economy. I happen to be in the camp that says actually those two things are really aligned, and actually we can achieve 
uh, both um, by working, you know, keeping those things aligned and, and front and centre about improving our customer experience. Yeah, and within that context, you've got the, the NPP platform. So tell us about that, but more specifically, why is it significant and what makes it so innovative? Because again, innovation came up in that address. Yeah, so the new payments platform, so I'm not actually sure it is terribly innovative. I think it's really exciting. And I think, you know, in a global scheme, it's not terribly innovative. For Australia, it is. And it's been a massive investment for, for the industry to be able to make you know, real-time payments, but more importantly than the real-time payments, the real data capabilities that uh, go along with it. You know, and the, the reality is we're at the very, very beginning. I think certainly at ANZ, and I know that a lot of the banks have been so focused on getting there quickly and responsibly, we haven't really turned our minds in any material way to the, all of the doors that this uh, technology will open up for us, but also for the fintech uh, t uh, teams out there, basically anybody. So it's an exciting first step. An exciting first step, but nonetheless, it is innovative. We were agreed on that. But how does, what does it, where does it bring Australia in, in terms of that international payment spectrum? How does it tie in? Well, you know, again, it's, it, 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 it's, we're amongst the early adopters, I guess, globally. I think we join a club of around 40 uh, economies around the world that have something that looks or feels like this. Obviously, ours is better, but, um, you know, we, so we, we're going to be connected. And I think um, what it really opens up and the next stage is how do we actually connect all of that and make it more of a global capability rather than just a domestic one. So, it's, as, as I said, the good news is that we've actually got a lot to learn from observing how this has been adopted and where the, this, the innovation that it's seeded in other economies we can learn from. Um, but as was said before, Australia actually has a pretty proud history of innovation and it's got a very strong fintech sector here and it's got great investment from the local banks who I'm sure will think of new things to do with the MPP platform as well. Where would you say that Australia is in its payments journey compared to other countries? Because things are obviously happening all the time. We, we can never really be static. So where does Australia yeah, stand? I, I, trust me, it never feels that anything <laughs> is static uh, from, where, from, my, from where I sit, that's for, for sure. As I said, I think we're at the early stages and I think NPP is one of those core pieces of infrastructure. It's the, a vital ingredient in building for the future. And what we know is we've got visibility about what some of those other ingredients are, certainly here in Australia, and that you know, probably the biggest other one is, is around uh, open banking and really opening up the banking system and uh, giving customers access and own, more direct ownership uh, of their data. And I think these two, amongst you know, a whole bunch of other things that we're doing, these, it's really when these two things come together that we'll see an explosion of new businesses, new business models, new revenue streams, new customer experiences. That will, we may look back and, you know, at a future Cybos and say that was the seed point when really uh, drove a, you know, a differentiation in our industry and you'll start to see different kinds of banks um, emerging. Yeah, so given what we've discussed so far, we will also project into the future a little bit further on in our chat. I mean, where do you think we are going, though, in that payment journey? And is it possible to say what the next step is? No, I don't know that it is possible to say that. I mean, I think what we've seen, you know, as was mentioned before, I've, I've worked for a, for a number of years in the industry. And, you know, when times were different and in the past, really the model was to... Essentially, the universal banking model was very, very attractive, where you would, uh, everything from the customer all the way down through to your technology stack, you would own and operate. And the way to, you know, the way to succeed, or for many banks, was to try and actually broaden their relationships and try and add more and more uh, uh, things to do. Over time, what we found is that uh, the cost of complexity of running that, whether it's a compliance cost, whether it's just general uh, cost of having you know, lots of things to do well, has made that less and less efficient or less um, sensible for many of us. And so I think um, as we open up data, as we move into open banking, as the new technology around big data, the cost of digital opportunity has dramatically reduced, I think it starts to throw into doubt that model and suggest, you know, from our perspective anyway, we think at ANZ that the only way to win in the future is to do a few things and do them really well. And, and the question there is, well, what are those few things? And I, I imagine that every bank will be grappling with its source of competitive advantage. But, you know, just kind of turning up and being a bank is no longer a successful model. And so I imagine there'll be people who specialise either vertically 
in terms of customer experience all the way down through data and, and you know, risk management models or operational expertise. And there'll be banks who, um, who specialise horizontally as well in terms of other ways of thinking about it. And, you know, and of course, the other thing, that the big subject at the moment, for us anyway, is thinking about partnering and opening up and the role of APIs and the role of partnering as a business model and what does that actually mean for banks. So I think you're going to see banks look less and less alike than we've become used to over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. What's underpinning all of this, of course, is disruption. So, you know, it's not just confined to the banking sector, it, it goes beyond that. So what are the lessons for the banks to learn from other industries, in your opinion, that are experiencing disruption? It doesn't happen in isolation. No. Well, I think we've, got to, we've always got a lot to learn. And I think a couple of lessons for me anyway. One is the danger of complacency. And the, and, the, and the other is really the people who survive in that disrupted world are those who can adapt, and those that can adapt at scale and at speed. And, you know, inherently, you know, everybody in this room, we, we work for la generally large organisations that are difficult to change, difficult to change culture, difficult to change strategy, direction, et cetera. And so I, I, I believe that that's really the challenge, and the people that will survive will be those banks that are agile, that can move at pace, that can respond to changing customer needs. I don't think we're in a position to be able to say we have any idea of what that future looks like. And, you know, I for one don't waste my time trying to predict what it will look like other than saying we just got to be ready. And, and the only way to be ready is have the right people who are capable of learning and adapting really quickly, who are open to new ideas, who look at other industries, who look at other professions and, and are curious and take on ideas and try to translate those into things that can work in a bank. That's, if you will, the software side of what we do. And then the other side is, of course, getting the hardware right, which is our technology stack, if you will, or our architecture that allows us, even if we have the most brilliant ideas in the world, you have to be able to implement them. And so do you have the technology and the ability to move at pace and change to the responding environment, whether that environment is customer need, regulatory need, community concern, competition, so it's that to me is really getting, and that, that requires a different architecture in a technical sense, but also the way you run the company and the, and the, and the way you think about it, the way you organise yourselves, uh, the, way you, you, the way you get work done. And as part of that architecture, do you see perhaps increased competition with some banks partnering up with others? Absolutely. Actually, one of, the, one of the really interesting things for me is, you know, banks, I mean, this is a great example. You know, Swift is a great example. Banks have actually always been quite good at partnering. We call it something different, but you know, the whole idea of correspondent banking is partnering. It's, it's leveraging each other's strengths, working together, ecosystems. So we've actually been doing this for a long, long time. It happens in the background. It's not necessarily visible to a lot of our customers, but banks are actually really quite good at this. So there's no reason to believe... Now, that's, as I said, that's largely been in the operational sense in the background. We need to bring those skills to the forefront because, you know, when you're talking about partnering, increasingly we're talking about from a customer experience point of view, you know, bundling services and, and products at the front end that may not necessarily be manufactured by us. So I think we have the capability. Not everybody will choose that path. We are choosing that path at ANZ. Uh, and it goes back to that philosophy of, you know, choose a few things to do, do them well, and partner with other people to kind of round out the right services for customers. So partner with other people who are really good at what they do. And um, what we've found, it's early days. Um, you know, just for example, our, our partnership with uh, Apple and bringing Apple Pay into the market here has exposed us to different thinking and different experiences of working with a company like that, you know. Or, or, or our approach um, as we're endeavouring into we're partnering with Zurich Insurance about the way we go to market there again. That, that exposure of our people to different ways of thinking, different skills, uh, makes, us, makes us stronger and, and, and better. So what does it tell us about how the role of banks is evolving? Well, it's, fun to, it's, it's changing really r rapidly, although it goes when you, at, the, at the surface, but if you go back to the fundamentals, we do pretty basic things for people. You know, we look after people's money. Um, we're trans we're, you know, we, we transform um, the timing of people's consumption by taking deposits and making loans. 
and we move money around for people, which is what this is all about here with Swift and, and Cybos. And actually, we're pretty good at those things. And because we're really good at it, it's largely invisible. And that's a great thing, but it means as an industry, we sometimes don't get credit for it. And I, you know, I think about just the innovation, the speed, the scale, the cost, low cost, I mean, of something like Swift is in, of enormous benefit to all of our uh, customers and, and, and the economy. So, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's lots to be proud of there. We've got to unlock some of those learnings from things that have been successful like this and move them into a different era. And that means that, you know, banks will look different in the future. And people are probably tired of hearing that. Some banks will look the same. And banks will start, and other ones like us will take different paths and, and will explore and experiment with uh, different business models. Right, but it does point to a big shift in the way that banks are currently doing things. This is part of the reality. Huge. I, I, well, I think so. Again, I'm not saying there isn't a role for people to keep doing the things they're used to. I think it takes a dramatic uh, shift, a reimagining of what customers really want and how do you deliver that, a rethinking about what you're really good at. Um, and that sometimes takes a lot of self-reflection because, you know, that has to be an honest assessment of what we're good at, not what we would like to think we're good at. Um, but a real honest assessment of what that is. And then working with others to shore up things where we have perhaps weaknesses uh, and, and, or, or, try, or trying to or learn as best we can from others, whether they're in the banking industry uh, or not. But it does take a mind, it, it does take a shift of mindset. Um, as I said, we, you know, Australia's been extremely fortunate, just talking about Australia for a minute, Australia's been very fortunate. We've had essentially 30 years of uninterrupted growth. I think it's the longest uninterrupted expansion in the OECD history. So we haven't had a recession since 1991. So life has been pretty good, and, and you know, you come here for those who visit. It's a great place. Uh, it's a great place to live. It's a great place to do business. And it's a great place to be a bank. But that in and of itself can breed a little bit of complacency. So, you know, one of the things that, in terms of one of the ingredients that needs to shift if we are going to be successful for the future in Australia is waking up to the fact that that strategy of the past is not going to work in the future and that we need to shift and, and we need to shift quickly and we need to do it safely uh, but we need to do it fast and you know to me that is the big challenge for uh, banks operating in Australia today whether you're, whether you're big or small. And it means embracing emerging technologies. So what are the emerging technologies that we have to well, prepare ourselves for? Everything, you know, and that's <laughs> why we come to places like this and this, everything. I mean, the obvious ones being, you know, whether it's machine learning, artificial intelligence, distributed ledger, all of these things are in operation today. I mean, you know, you come to a bank like us, like all of us, we're all either using those things every day or we're experimenting and piloting. And, and many of those experiments and, and, and um, piloting that we're doing is doing it in conjunction with, with other partners. So I think we're trying all of, all of those things. I don't know which of those will be the thing that really fundamentally changes the bank. It's probably a blend of all of them. But I think our view is you have to be involved. You can't sit back and wait and say, oh, we'll wait until that's established and then we'll get on later. I think you have to be early. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to change the whole bank and shift it all to distributed ledger technology tomorrow. But I think you've got to dabble. You've got to experiment. You've got to learn. Um, a, because of the actual technical things that you learn along the way, and we learn a lot of those things in our working in those areas. But B, it's, again, it's part of this culture of learning, adapting, trying things, modifying, keep going, you know, exposing you to different people with different ideas. So it's as much a cultural issue to me as it is about the technology. I mean, we sit here today, we're all so used to the fact that we bank on our phone, uh, and yet, you know, smartphones are 10 years old, and so it just shows you how quickly technology has fundamentally changed, and, you know, essentially phones today are our number one customer engagement tool, and yet that's happened in a really short period of time. If we'd have sat here 10 years ago, I don't, well, I wouldn't, I don't know that I would have been able to predict that, um, just like I'm not sure I can sit here and say, hey, it's, it's uh, artificial intelligence is going to be the thing. I don't know what it is. could be anything. But look, the theme of this year's Cybos is enabling the digital economy. And presumably you also find that people are a massively important factor 
in this period of technological change. You can't exclude them. And that's, really, that's something which I know you feel very passionately about. Yeah, I do. I mean, I don't think they're a secret to our successes because we pick the best technology or because, you know, we have a better product than somebody else uh, today uh, or that we're necessarily, you know, a lower cost producer of something. It'll be because we're better. And, and the only way to be better is to be constantly adapting to your customers' needs. And you kind of reduce that down and say, again, I go back to what I said before, the only way you can do that sustainably is by having better people with a better working culture, a culture that embraces change, a growth mindset, a team that likes learning, a team that's willing to experiment, a culture that tolerates those things, a culture that listens to customers, that adapt, follows other industries, takes those learnings from there and is able to translate those into things that might be of relevance to us, and a culture of partnering with other people who are specialists. All of those things are human. They're not done by robots. And so I, you know, and we also know even if you look at it from the other side, the really simple side in terms of our customer engagement, of course, techno you know, customers want a better experience and increasingly they engage with us in a digital way or using technology. But all the research that we've done and other people in this room will have done says our customers actually still want to talk to somebody when they're doing something that's of real importance to them. When they're making a life-changing decision about buying a home or saving for their retirement or starting a business or whatever it might be, they still seek affirmation and advice and, and, and direction from talking to a person. And that's a fundamental human need. I don't know that uh, that will uh, completely disappear. And so I think there is also a very, very important role. And it's about, you know, we talk here about the bionic bank. For those of you old enough to remember the $6 million man, you know, the best of humankind and the best of technology blended together. That's essentially what I think banking will be of the future. And all we're saying is that the technology piece at the moment is, is growing in importance. But there'll always be a role. And it's about the banks that can get that blend from an from a, a operational and delivery point of view, but also a customer experience point of view. Getting that blend right, that's the bank. Those are the banks that will succeed and continue to thrive in a fast-changing world. Shane, it's been really positive speaking to you as well, getting an insight about what's happening in your world, how it's going to affect us all. And look, this is a huge gathering here. People will take away what they wish. But if you were to give one takeaway to the Cybos delegates here today, what would it be? Um, I've been to a few of these events. I think it goes back to that theme I talked about. It's about being open-minded. I mean, you, you, we, I find these exciting because you have this opportunity to meet with all these people that you would otherwise not have that opportunity to. And every one of those meetings, every one of those networking meetings, every one of those booths is the opportunity to learn. And I mean, that sounds hokey, but that's what these things are about. It's to come here and obviously strengthen relationships, but actually to learn and to steal ideas and see things that might work in your place or see how if I could adapt that thing for my team, how we could be better. So I think it's about just being completely open-minded and really being out there and, and, and listening and absorbing as much information as you can in a short period of time. Shane Elliott, thank you so much. Thank it you. really has been so insightful. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Shane, for that inspiring discussion. Indeed, the speed of change is a big challenge. So ladies and gentlemen, as you can predict, I will make three points today. First, I will describe what SWIFT is doing at your request to enable your payments and securities businesses. Second, I will discuss cyber both as a threat and perhaps in the context of correspondent banking and commercial opportunities here. And third, I will suggest an enhanced engagement model with SWIFT, essentially making the point that what you get out of SWIFT is what you put into it. I really don't have to describe to you that this is a dynamic time for the industry. With increased competition from non-bank providers, technology innovation, the likes of which we have not seen before. What is constant for SWIFT is that we are a bank-owned cooperative. 
with more than 3,000 shareholders, connecting 10,000 banks, operating in 200 countries, and helping operate the networks for over 100 market financial infrastructures, and with 150 central banks. We are a global, neutral, and critical market utility. Our main duty of care is for the security, integrity of the global financial system. So let's get started. You as owners have asked us, as your fintech, to fundamentally help you re-engineer international payments via what we call GPI, the Global Payments Innovation. It is growing at amazing speed, no pun intended, with 50% plus of payments credited to your end beneficiaries within 30 minutes and with massive adoption across the ecosystem. The SWIFT board representing the entire SWIFT community has endorsed universal adoption of GPI by end 2020. And Gottfried will describe with even more clarity and the functionality and capability we will be introducing at rapid speed here. But another capability that is presenting itself is with APIs. Shane mentioned them. And of course, Swift has already seized this technology to help drive forward major changes, both in standards and platforms. But this is not just for its own development. It's also there to help you innovate and customize on Swift's platform for your own customers. And this game will be a bit different. They won't be, you know, just standards releases and annual type uh, things that we do. It will be regular innovation, regular updates with speed. And then there is data, leveraging its intelligence carefully and with the right boundaries. As you can well imagine, Swift has tremendous data and information, leveraging it for your business purposes in a collective way. Confidentiality and integrity is key. And Swift takes that job very, very seriously. We understand our responsibilities here. And let me not let you forget securities, which is 50% of Swift's traffic and growing in double digits. The senior securities executives of the major institutions have reminded Swift that new technologies, including APIs, are important to them, as are strong cyber practices. And Swift, of course, continues to partner with them in this space. So now let me move to cyber. This threat is here to stay and evolve. But I'm not going to go over Swift CSP. You all understand this well. But I, what will, I will talk about is the three foundations of det uh, protection, detection, and recovery. All three are fundamentally critical. But cyber protection, I would submit to you, is not just a security issue. It is a commercial opportunity. Those firms that are able to work, work with their end customers to protect, detect, and recover will be competitively advantaged in the future. Thank you for your attestations. And for those you must deliver by year end. The global transaction banks are ready to consume these and make his key business decisions. But let me remind you a little bit of that, what that means. Many global transaction banks are already looking at your self-attestations. By early next year, they will begin incorporating them into their risk management processes, and then starting to decide how they will continue to do business with you in the context of cyber risk. And the bar on the mandatory controls will continue to get raised as this threat will evolve. Let me talk to you a little bit about what SWIFT is doing to help. There is the daily validation report, which provides banks through a different channel the very next day how to understand if new payment patterns and flows and activities has occurred. And then there is the sender payments control service, 
launched last week, which actively helps real-time message blocking based on the thresholds you set. Now, both of these can be a line of defense for sender banks. And the global transaction banks may start asking their clients to use them as mitigating controls. Now, SWIFT, on your behalf, helps put this all together. Payments capability, cyber protection, mitigating controls, with scale, global penetration, and substance. Now, at every step of this fast evolution, the G10 central banks that oversee SWIFT have been deeply engaged, directive, and helpful. We as a community are better for it. So my final point to you is what you get out of SWIFT is what you put into it. Your SWIFT is moving fast, engaging, and increasingly working with a coalition of the willing banks that want to innovate and partner with SWIFT as its fintech. In this dynamic environment, seizing the opportunity with, with speed is important. SWIFT is moving rapidly in this changing area to work with all the banks. Allow me, though, to end with, again, three industry observations. The first is, it is not just the speed of change, but also the diversity of change, from technology to product innovations to risk management that we must all simultaneously manage well. Second, the war for diverse talent is global and a key differentiator. And talking about differentiation, number three, there is increasing differentiation between those firms that are investing in client capability and cyber and those that are not. We at SWIFT look forward to working with the entire community to support you. We are fortunate to have a strong governance and a highly capable global board. We're also fortunate to have an exceptional CEO and a strong management team. It is my honor and privilege to serve you as chairman of this board. Thank you. Now I would like to call to the podium SWIFT CEO, Gottfried Leibrandt. Gottfried. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Good to be back in Sydney and seeing so many uh, familiar faces as well as uh, new ones. Uh, and yes, the city has changed a lot. The venue is a different one uh, from last time. And indeed, change is everywhere. Uh, the world is changing fast and perhaps faster than ever before. Now, before we get carried away, this is not an entirely new observation. In fact, it was first noted uh, about two and a half thousand years ago by a Greek philosopher, Heraclitus. Um, here's his picture, um, who coined the famous phrase, you cannot step into the same river twice. You can also see here that the notion that everything changes doesn't lead to great happiness. The man doesn't look ecstatic. Um, so that hasn't changed. And I wonder what he would feel like if he were to step in uh, today's uh, streets of, let's say, uh, Hong Kong or Athens of that matter. Would he feel vindicated and be happy or be absolutely terrified? We, we will not know. Uh, but things indeed do change. Fortunately, there are a couple of things that don't change. And one of the things that is not changing is the list of things that keep me awake at night. It is still the same list as when I became CEO uh, six or seven years ago. So what's keeping me awake at night? Jet lag. No, seriously. Um, it is <laughs> cyber, geopolitics, and technological change. Those are the things that really keep us, uh, keep us occupied. Cyber, that clearly was top of the, of the list um, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and we launched a massive customer security program together with our community. A lot of investment by us and the banks we, uh, we work with. Um, through that customer security program, one of the big parts is information sharing, and through that we have now much better visibility on, on breaches that happen at our customers uh, around the Swift environment. And one of the things we observe is that the bad guys keep trying, and they're also evolving their methodology and getting more sophisticated at it. So CSP is as relevant as ever. Fortunately, we're also seeing good results. Banks are implementing the controls, 
uh, and perhaps as importantly, the quick information sharing and close cooperation in case of fraudulent payments is leading to, to quick recovery of, uh, of funds. Um, and that has really prevented these type of attacks and limited the, the, the damage significantly compared to the, uh, the attack we saw uh, two and a half uh, years ago. So great progress there, but we need to keep uh, going at it. And perhaps we can take consolation from the fact that the financial industry isn't the only one dealing with this problem. Uh, last year with WannaCry we saw the healthcare industry dealing with it. This year we saw one you may not have expected uh, grapple with uh, cyber, um, and that is the video game industry. Um, the, I, have a, I have a son who's a, who's a video gamer, and he pointed out that the new release of Assassin's Creed, which is a big franchise, led to a movie. The latest episode, again, plays in Greece, so I thought I'd stay on the theme. But the latest launch, billion-dollar event, was completely disrupted by a DDoS attack, which prevented all the gamers from uh, joining the, the new release. My son was not happy, but I was able to quote uh, Leon Trotsky to him, you may not be interested in cyber, but cyber is interested in you. Um, Technology change, that's clearly top of the list uh, right now. It is everywhere. The amount of investment going into fintech is at an all-time high. There used to be a time when a $1 billion technology startup, fintech startup, was so rare that it was called a unicorn, an animal that doesn't exist, right? You never see it. Well, these days, it looks like we have herds of unicorns, right? They're everywhere. Um, and, and not just in fintech in general, in payments. Um, for example, we have Adyen in Europe, worth 20 billion. We have Wirecard in Germany, 24 billion. That is more than many or most of the, uh, of the European banks uh, right now. Um, so, you know, you could argue that payments are hot and sexy, right? Look at all of us. We, we are... Uh, never mind. <coughs> um, but, of course, the real action takes place elsewhere in the world, and that takes me to the, uh, maybe not the elephant in the room, but the panda bear in the room, and that is, of course, China. Um, uh, which really plays a role. Of the, of the 20 top technology companies in the world, I saw a recent list, 11 were American, 9 are Chinese. And that's the list. Um, so, two, the two top Chinese ones are Alibaba and uh, Tencent, uh, of course. They're deeply into payments. And how did they do that? It's because they have created apps where people, 1 billion Chinese cus uh, customers, do everything in that app. Everything, including payments, at the point of sale, two-thirds of payments at point of sale in China are electronic, and that's not cards. All of that is, is Alipay and WeChat, which is the, uh, the app of, uh, of Tencent uh, at the end of the day. In fact, these apps in China have become so addictive that they now have special lanes for people walking with their cell phone and to prevent them from bumping into each other. <laughs> Now, we can all be, all be smug about this and say, yeah, but that's, you know, that's, that's domestic China and that is retail, that doesn't concern us. Well, I think with the blurring of the distinction between domestic and international, between retail and wholesale, I think as an industry uh, and as SWIFT, we should really take note. We should take it as both an inspiration and a call to action. We need to adapt. We need to change as ever before. And we, I mean us, SWIFT, as well as the, the banks and the institutions we work with. Now, I would argue that we are, of course, and I can think of no better example of that than GPI. Three years ago, Cybos was also in Asia. In Singapore, GPI was an idea. It was, we had a meeting of people, it came up as an idea, a set of PowerPoints. Now, three years later in Singapore, not only is GPI functioning, existing, but it is getting adopted, it is ubiquitous, and that's just a fancy word for everywhere. Um, uh, so, really good adoption. We are now looking at making it uh, universal in just another two years, as, uh, as Jawar mentioned. In another four weeks, we'll have standards release 2018, and the use of the identifier that allows you to identify a payment end-to-end -end will be in every uh, SWIFT instruction. Um, that means that all payments become trackable, and next year, I can announce here, we will make a simple version of that tracker available to all financial institutions. So you can all track where your payments are. It's also fast. Most payments are made in a, in a matter of, uh, of minutes. Um, but perhaps GPI is more than just ubiquity, track, uh, trackable, track and trace, and speed. It is also a platform that really allows for new services and extensions built on top of that. 
two examples of that. One is banks are already putting it inside their electronic banking application. Here is one example from China, of course. Um, and I can say, had we realized that banks would be putting GPI into their customer-facing applications, we might have thought a bit better about the name and come up with something sexier than GPI, but okay. It is now what it is, and it's being exposed. The other example is um, also in Asia-Pacific. We are running a pilot to interconnect GPI to domestic real-time systems, so uh, the, the systems of uh, three countries, uh, Vietnam, Singapore, and Hong Kong. We're allowing payments initiated on there through the correspondence banks to be paid out in Australia through AU and PP. Really quick payments end-to-end, -end, leveraging the domestic real-time payment infrastructures, the banks and GPI in the middle. And I think that's, that's a very promising, uh, promising uh, thing to go as, uh, as well. And speaking of AU and PP, of course, here in Australia, uh, went live a couple of months ago. Um, Great adoption as well. We worked with the banks. Um, I had a demonstration from one of my uh, one of my colleagues uh, earlier uh, this uh, this weekend. It really works. You can send a payment not to just somebody's account, but if you have their mobile phone number or email, you can send it. People are using it. We're seeing it. You should ask if you run into local Australians to demonstrate it to you. It's available to uh, all the all the customers. So for those of you who are of my generation, um, if you run into this guy. Don't ask for his knife, ask him to show you a real-time payment. Um, and it's not just Australia, we are going to go live with real-time payments in Europe as well. Next month, uh, Swift for TIPS and RT1, the EBA solution, will be live and up, and up and running as well. What most excites me though is what is under the hood at the end of the day. And what's under the hood is a completely different technology than you're used to from, uh, from Swift. That's an important point. Um, if you look at um, AUNPP, we did that with a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. We put all the intelligence at the edge, the, the uh, payment gateway that we run at the bank, that's where the intelligence uh, is. Um, with TIPS and RT1 in Europe, we're taking it one step further. That intelligent edge is based on container technology from Docker. That means that you can swap in and out modules quite easily without replacing the whole thing. It's almost like downloading an app from the, uh, from the App Store. And then, of course, there's API technology. We are really betting big on APIs. It is inside GPI, of course. There's the only way you can embed the tracker into your customer-facing applications is by that API uh, technology. It's a simple API call to the tracker that you carry through to, uh, to your customers. Many of our services are enabled with, uh, with GPI. In fact, for some of the newer RTGS systems, we're looking to replace the cache management browse function with API calls, so we're going to put it inside our, our messaging functionality uh, as well. Um, so I really see that as a, as a, as a big technology that's, uh, that's under the hood for, uh, for everyone. So unlike the German car companies, we are, we are not fudging the numbers and the old technology, etc. We're moving ahead of time and really going to the, to the, new, uh, to the new technology uh, fast. But like the car companies, we're doing so with a continued focus on operational excellence. You don't want your car to fail in the middle of a highway as you're overtaking and the truck comes the other way. You really want your car to work. You want your Swift to work as well. So for us, failure was and is not an option uh, in all of this. So, what is on the horizon? I guess bionic banks and bionic Swift. Um, who knows? Um, I, will, I will not uh, uh, venture to predict uh, the future. That's famously hard and dangerous. What I do know is that we will see more disruption, more change um, coming, coming our way, and, and a continued need to adapt. At the same time, I feel confident that the banks and SWIFT are in a place to capture the opportunities that are, that are offered by, uh, by all of this, but it will require uh, significant work. I also agree that an open mind is a great thing. Change favors the open mind. And no better place to have an open mind than here at Cybos. I would want to especially recommend the uh, Discovery Zone. We have 70 fintechs here. That's the greatest number ever at, uh, at Cybos for you to explore, etc. Um, and then uh, perhaps to, uh, to close with, uh, with an, uh, another uh, quote from our Greek philosopher Heraclitus, uh, he also said, if you do not expect the unexpected, you will not find it. And what better place to expect the unexpected here in Sydney? Have a great Cybos. Thank you. <laughs>